Hi guys, it's time for uh, another relevant topic in uh, fisheries technology. Uh, this time I'll be presenting my assignment in fish health management. This is a paper published in uh, uh, Reviews in Aquaculture. It's a recent publication, just in this 2021. Uh, the title, uh, 12 Point uh, Checklist for uh, Surveillance of Diseases of Aquatic Organisms, a novel approach to assist uh, multidisciplinary teams in developing countries. As you can see here, uh, you can find here all the authors who contributed in this uh, paper. This is uh, definitely something to read. Now, the title is self-explanatory, a checklist that can be used in designing and executing active uh, surveillance of aquaculture species was developed. So this is also geared towards uh, multidisciplinary teams in developing countries. As we all know, uh, uh, these countries have uh, limited capabilities and expertise, especially on fish health monitoring. So let's go directly to uh, the checklist so that somehow uh, we can connect things that we will discuss here. So we have here, number one, scenario setting, okay? Uh, defining surveillance objective, defining the populations, uh, disease clustering, case definition, uh, diagnostic testing, study design and sampling, data collection and management, data analysis, validation and quality assurance, human and financial resources, and surveillance in the bigger picture. Uh, we must expect that we will be looking at different aspects because again, you should adapt the uh, multidisciplinary approach that needs a robust understanding of fish biology, aquaculture, and capture practices. So of course, that also includes disease management and uh, your generalized scientific method and research. So we're talking of surveillance here, guys. Let's talk about the money involved here, our investments, their investments. Okay, that also includes the legalities, I think. Uh, information management, and even politics. So that's the essence of the uh, uh, multidisciplinary approach. And of course, it can be overwhelming to uh, newbies in developing countries. Now, uh, the checklist allows for a simple to follow uh, approach on surveillance so that we can never get lost in the complexities. Uh, this can eventually build confidence and expertise. Okay, and that can perhaps result to uh, the creation of uh, biosecurity programs, or if they are already uh, existing, we can improve those programs. Okay, now uh, disease surveillance, I think, is uh, a component of uh, biosecurity efforts of the UN, and that is also relevant to uh, a variety of their uh, sustainab sustainability goals, okay? Aquaculture is the fastest growing food production sector in the world. And uh, we, we also knew that uh, new diseases emerge from time to time. So it seems that uh, uh, monitoring becomes uh, more and more complicated. So some new species, for example, have been successfully cultured. Uh, maybe uh, it can offer uh, a potential for global uh, popularity. But then, new diseases can emerge and can destroy the potential. So just imagine the financial losses that could have been saved if we have a disease-free aquaculture environment. But sadly, of course, we can only lower the occurrence of the disease. Okay? We cannot uh, totally eradicate it. Now, the objectives of disease surveillance can be one of the following. Okay? To demonstrate the absence of a disease, Okay, to, to identify events requiring not notification, okay, you should know when you need to report. Or to determine the occurrence or distribution of endemic diseases. Now, uh, several important reporting systems exist for aquatic animal diseases, such as the World Animal Health uh, Information System or the WAHIS of the World Organization for Animal Health. Also have the... Uh, uh, yeah, Animal Disease Notification System of the European Union and FAUS, Emergency Prevention System for uh, Animal Health. We call that your Empress AH. 
the first ever uh, regional aquatic disease reporting system, the uh, quarterly animal disease reports in Asia and the Pacific region was uh, developed by the Network of uh, Aquaculture Centers in Asia Pacific, or the NACA. And of course, FAO and uh, your OIE through the FAO Technical Cooperation uh, Program project, or TCP project. Now, in most developing countries, aquatic disease surveillance responsibility is separate from uh, veterinary uh, services. Now, in the Philippines, uh, I'm not really sure of this, but I think BFAR handles disease surveillance and reporting, and also perhaps uh, in collaboration with other aquaculture centers like DEC. The process of designing and uh, implementing an aqu aquatic surveillance program can be a challenging task, especially for personnel with uh, limited knowledge in disease epidemiology and the uh, principles of surveillance. Several FAO projects uh, addressing aquatic animal health included, of course, your capacity building on disease detection, uh, reporting according to international standards, and training of uh, national stakeholders in aquatic disease surveillance. Now, uh, this 12-point uh, checklist aims to serve as guidance for a multidisciplinary team that may consist, of course, of aquaculture officers, biologists, veterinarians, uh, laboratory personnel, uh, inspection officers, okay, who are tasked to perform surveillance of diseases in farm and wild populations. And in many cases, except for, of course, the, uh, the uh, more technical uh, professionals like veterinarians and aquaculturists, other members have no formal training in epidemiology, including uh, aquatic epidemiology and uh, surveillance. Now, that checklist draft was developed again by a, a, a thorough review of available uh, literature and studies on aquatic disease surveillance. Then it was, uh, according to the authors here, they presented this in uh, several FAO regional workshops to gain uh, further perspectives and insights on their application to diseases in uh, aquaculture systems. So the need for a multidisciplinary team and implementation requirements were of course uh, considered. So without much uh, further ado, uh, let's examine each item in the checklist. First, uh, we have scenario setting. So of course, that involves looking into the national status of the disease in question. It, uh, of course, uh, covers surveillance activities, the uh, health status of shared resources, like your watersheds, even uh, your neighboring countries and uh, trade partners. So it also must ensure uh, data sources because uh, uh, we can create uh, false, uh, we can create a false scenario if our uh, data is unreliable. Now, so basically, we can uh, generalize three scenarios, three scenarios here. So scenario one, or the infected status, means that a particular disease, or shall we say uh, disease X here, has been reported in literature to be present in both cultured and wild species. So this has already been reported to uh, competent authorities, or CAs, of the country, who also forwarded this to the uh, OIE. Now, scenario two is considered free status. So, meaning there is reliable evidence okay, that, uh, uh, what do you call this? Uh, there is reliable evidence from previous surveillance and also testimonials from trade partners that uh, the uh, country is considered free from uh, a particular disease. Okay, now scenario three on the other hand is the unknown status. Okay, no reported cases, no previous uh, surveillance, however. Okay, but and uh, there is consider considerable doubt as to the absence of, uh, or let's say, presence of the disease because of, let's say, maybe unreported cases in the private sector or among neighboring countries. So when we say unknown, 
uh, the need to investigate is critical to elevate the status to uh, scenario 2 or establish scenario 1 for the identified disease. Of course, what, uh, whatever scenario there is, surveillance is still needed even if you are declared as disease-free for a particular pathogen. Uh, much more if you are uh, in the infected or unknown status. So there is a looming threat that needs to be neutralized. And uh, the existing status should inform us on how to align our objectives. So in step two, we need to define our surveillance objective. Okay, should we focus more on understanding the disease, like uh, classifying it as endemic or exotic or emerging disease? So is it uh, practical to only limit the surveillance to disease presence only? So uh, based on own certification standards, for example, so uh, we can simply save time, money, and effort. Now let's face it. Uh, the reality in some developing countries is that surveillance is um, totally impossible due to uh, uh, various limitations in manpower and time, the av availability of resources, or uh, uh, other constraints. So uh, the objectives must perhaps also be informed by this. Okay, again, as I've said, the availability of resources or how serious the status of the disease is. So this is a clarifying example here that they place on the paper. Okay, exa examples of uh, the objective of disease X surveillance. You can just read this. Okay, you have the scenari scenarios here, uh, infected status. Okay, and the objective to establish the frequency and distribution of disease X at the national level in wild and farm populations. Okay, another objective to identify possible risk, uh, risk factors for disease X. Okay, so if that is the scenario, if you have an unknown status scenario, you can have these objectives also. All right, so next is to define our populations of interest. So this is where we will apply the findings of our surveillance. So think of the population uh, as the host of uh, the pathogen in question, or maybe subgroups within that population that is susceptible to the disease. So, so like in the case of early mortality syndrome, uh, of course, that only affects early juveniles or post larvae of prawns, for example. So that's uh, only a subgroup of the population. And uh, in the uh, surveillance plan, okay, we need information such as uh, the list of uh, susceptible groups, okay, both farmed and wild species, including uh, their environment, like uh, natural resources, uh, like bodies of water or farms. Because uh, in the uh, ecological sense, uh, since everything is interconnected, uh, disease transmission can be easily accomplished. So this is why we need to really account every component factor or influence surrounding the population. Now the paper mentioned here about uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria. When they, when, uh, when you are going to define the population. Now fixed variables that refer to the key characteristic of the population should be the inclusion criteria. Again, inclusion. When you are going to uh, consider to include that population in the study. For example, the idea of uh, your species being farmed or cultured, whether they're susceptible or not, their habitat, okay, these are objective in nature. And uh, the data that we can derive from this are expected to be more reliable than some uh, random condition or biased features. But we can still use the uh, negative or unreliable features to uh, create our exclusion criteria. So it means that when choosing a population, the exclusion criteria can warn us in the uh, decision making if we still want to work with the population at hand. So this step is like choosing the best informants for your investigation. All right, number four. Next, we have disease clustering here. So clustering means an aggregation of cases of a disease uh, uh, that are... Uh, closely grouped in time and place. Now, if a, a particular disease tend to cluster 
let's say they are more localized in a particular farm or they are localized in just one part of the farm or maybe they are usually common among wild species okay so it's really important that we are aware of this tendency if uh, because even if we uh, if we treat the disease as a random event that do not follow a particular pattern uh, our framework in the surveillance will be erroneous and uh, we will also tend to uh, interpret data incorrectly i believe clustering is uh, is a natural pattern in disease epidemiology that's why it is included here in the checklist so the sharing of the environment the seasons if we have a parasitic disease of course we are also talking of a common host or intermediates these are obvious factors that can trigger clustering and knowledge of this is very important of course in the timing and in the in your extraction of data and also when clustering is detected you can leave a portion of probability that that disease is uh, not yet an outbreak so maybe it's just clustered in this particular environment or farm and of course that can save you a lot of uh, trouble when planning for the next step okay so this means we need to take account uh, uh, clustering when uh, uh, developing a research design in data analysis maybe we can use uh, non-parametric tests or uh, utilize covariates or select statistical tools that can handle clustering issues. All right, fifth step is case definition. There are uh, three levels mentioned in the paper. So we have clinical, laboratory level, and the epidemiological level. So that's all uh, self-explanatory. Now, case definition is an agreed set of rules that permits investigators to uh, uniformly decide that a particular individual has or does not have a particular disease. So we will be dealing with what we call as a suspected case. Okay, suspected case and the so-called confirmed case. I think these are not hard to understand concepts. Obviously, a more reliable instrument has already been used to confirm the disease or the positive agent of the disease for your uh, confirmed case. So suspected means we're still not sure because again, uh, disease symptoms can overlap. At least upon initial glance or inspection, one already has something in mind or a, rob a robust hypothesis about the disease at hand. Meaning if, even if we're still on the level where um, we are considering that an entity is a suspect, uh, we can still be unanimous with our consideration because we uh, already have a well-defined case description in mind. Now, the capability of the surveillance system increases its uh, sensitivity and of course it can result to a reliable case definition okay so i'm now in number six i'm almost halfway in these steps okay we have diagnostic testing and this includes description of tests uh, procedures interpretation of results okay sensitivity and specificity and of course it also we also have here uh, competent laboratories uh, almost everyone are familiar with the term diagnostics, especially in this time of pandemic. Uh, most of these um, uh, diagnostic tests in uh, for COVID-19, for example, utilizes advanced molecular tools and techniques like PCR, RT-PCR, <clears throat> and genomics, or conventional methods like cell culture or histological examinations. Uh, of course, a fish patho pathologist can fully explain all of this to us. But again, always remember step two. So we need to stick to our objectives when deciding on what to do in this step. Okay, concerning the choice of the techniques, uh, it is important to account on analytical sensitivity. So it, um, it means that we need to use instruments that are very sensitive as much as we can. So uh, when we talk about sensitivity, it is the limit of uh, detection for a disease agent. Okay, and also our analysis should also be more specific. So we will be looking at the analytical specificity or the ability to uh, distinguish the target disease agent from another. So if we are choosing the laboratory test, again, uh, it should have specificity and it must be sensitive. 
okay? And um, uh, diagnostic accuracy relies on a solid case history. Okay, so FAO has long promoted the use of level 1, level 2, and level 3 for disease diagnosis. So level 1 inclu includes uh, farm or production site observations. So your record keeping mechanisms must be in place. And uh, of course, gross clinical signs. So when you now upgrade to level 2 diagnosis, that already includes the equipment and the experience to undertake analysis that can detect and or identify a range of pathogens. Okay, so uh, level 2 laboratories can do parasitology, okay, histopath, okay, bacteriology, and myco myco mycological examinations. And are, generally speaking, uh, the uh, persons involved here are experienced with uh, endemic and opportunistic disease agents in their area, region, or country. So I guess our fish lab here in uh, ISCOF can be considered level 2 because again, we can do all of this uh, we, and we have an expert here, Dr. Gomez, who can perform all of these diagnostic tests. Now, uh, level 3 uh, diagnostics, of course, is much higher than level 2 and it, it encompasses those techniques uh, that target a specialized pathogen or group of pathogens and uh, level 3 already utilizes more advanced equipment. Okay, virology, immunology, and uh, molecular techniques are included in level three, including the use of field kits. Okay, so in a, in a robust uh, surveillance system, it must be ensured that diagnostics personnel know what level they are. Okay, and uh, they should also know who to refer to, uh, the cases that they cannot fully handle. Okay, or, or maybe they must also know the diagnostic history of a case that came from another facility. So I believe that it is already part of the um, QMS or quality management uh, uh, strategy of all standard laboratories that they ensure uh, the uniform, uh, uniformity of test results. All right, number seven, we are now into the study design and sampling. So here, uh, we are now entering what looks like a standard research process. So study design and sampling. Of course, uh, this is, but uh, but we'll be using here uh, designs and frameworks that complement epidemiolog uh, epidemiological uh, cases. So we've already discussed a few overlapping elements in the previous steps, like choosing the population and considering clustering. Now, the primary purpose of sampling is to be able to get uh, good representatives of the population. There are plenty of uh, sampling techniques in literature. When it comes to getting samples from farms or in the wild, we have random and non-random sampling. Okay, That's the basic elements of research that every professional has learned in college will be uh, put to good use here. Of course, I will no longer discuss each of this. So just read the paper in detail and you can clarify those concepts yourselves. Uh, samples will uh, provide us with data. Now in the uh, multidisciplinary team, there must be at least one member who is an expert data analyst. So take note that the uh, statistical analysis has already been established as directed by the objectives of the surveillance. Okay, this means before, before the actual collection of data, you already know what to collect and how the analysis will proceed. And sampling is already part of a plan or design of the research. Uh, you only collect the data that you need and uh, you are or you should be confident that your samples provide you with uh, reliable data. So uh, here in step eight, this now leads us to uh, data collection after sampling. So in a much more general sense, there can, this can also be done in a variety of ways. The pa paper here mentioned about uh, active and passive data collection. Active collection, of course, involves direct uh, field sampling and investigation, while if you have passive collection, you only rely on secondary sources of data, like maybe suspicion reports, maybe uh, 
a text from a colleague in a different laboratory or a friend in the academe who happened to uh, observe something of interest. Again, uh, uh, data is still the central component of uh, this step. Okay, so you can have both numerical or categorical data. There are a variety of instruments to consider, like a simple questionnaire or a checklist or a survey form. And uh, it is important also that ethical issues are well understood by both the collectors and the sources of data. Okay, there are even parts where we have uh, the social part, maybe, of this. And uh, every stakeholder must be informed that uh, data is being collected and uh, the purpose that this data will be used okay and number nine or step nine is of course when you have the data you will have data analysis and still we're in the standard research process format here so what is data if you cannot analyze it to form a meaningful uh, story or a meaningful inference or conclusion Again, we can use a variety of data analysis techniques, both quantitative and qualitative in this step. And the most common in, of course, quantitative uh, analysis is common in experimental research, in epidemiological studies, uh, usually uh, uh, based on what I have read so far. Usually they are more into uh, association studies. Okay, so you relate various variables with, uh, let's say, the disease at hand. Okay, you also have uh, more mean comparisons. Okay, they're also convenient, let's say, to quantify uh, the magnitude or of outbreaks or, let's say, mortality rates. And um, the use of prediction tools like your regression analysis are also helpful, maybe to assist, to, uh, to assess, I mean, uh, risks. Also, we should uh, also consider uh, not so common uh, probability distributions because again, in normal or in academic research, we are usually more uh, used to the uh, binomial uh, probability distributions. Okay, and um, in the field, okay, we should also try to take a look at other uh, probability distributions that we can use in our hypothesis testing. So examples of uh, usually unusual Distributions are your, let's say, poison and uh, logistic distributions. Again, uh, we have to leave this step to the most competent person in the team when it comes to data analysis. Okay, number 10, we have quality assurance and validation. At this point, I am now convinced that about half of these steps here are aligned with uh, the known rigors of the scientific method. And uh, the rest uh, simply uh, integrates management concepts. And uh, again, in this step, you will be, uh, uh, this step will try to verify if we've been fooling around in the previous steps. Okay, statistical tests should be consistent with our known levels of confidence. We know it's 95% or 99% confidence. Uh, it should matter, the confidence level of every test. Uh, errors in judgment can have destructive consequences. Okay, we should we need to have pilot testing. Okay, even peer review. Well, even if after you have uh, submitted the paper, it must be reviewed by uh, your peers in the academe. Uh, you also need to look at management audits. Okay, monitoring. These are obvious validation procedures that should always be uh, a separate step in whatever management process we are developing such as this uh, surveillance checklist. Now, the paper listed these examples of quality assurance requirements. Okay, here. I bet we are all familiar with uh, ISO accreditation systems. Okay, step 11. Here comes the cost of everything we have discussed so far. So, resources, resources, resources. So, we'll just state what is written on the paper here. Uh, surveillance is an economic activity okay and in this step it is essential to plan in advance the uh, resources both human and financial resources that is needed based on the surveillance design developed in previous steps now in this step a uh, checklist of field logistics okay operational requirements okay uh, the you need to complete that okay or um, 
a checklist of the surveillance team or the agnostic team, okay, event communication, okay, farms to be visited, uh, the work plan, and the budget. In addition, um, you have also to raise the awareness concer concerning the uh, surveillance activity. To uh, You have to raise the awareness of your targeted farmers, including uh, training of the teams that I have uh, mentioned a while ago. Now, if uh, surveillance is uh, project-based, it has to be reviewed and approved by uh, your project proponents. So if this is a regular activity of an aquatic animal health program, it has to be approved by concerned authorities. In both cases, the financial allocation should be provided. And last step involves surveillance in the big picture. So this last step puts active surveillance for uh, disease X in line with uh, overall national strategies for enhancement of uh, aquaculture biosecurity and health of aquatic organisms aquaculture and uh, international trade, as well as your One Health platform. Uh, well, I guess in my own synthesis of this step is that uh, the surveillance system must not only be limited to uh, providing solutions to fish diseases at hand, so it has to uh, systemi systematically contribute knowledge to literature, as well as promote good practices that can be modeled by other institutions in the society. So don't forget that uh, publication of the findings of the surveillance is uh, already a form of reporting. Okay, peer review is one way to validate the reports. We also have to go with, uh, or let's say we have to go back again to the uh, primary target of this checklist, of course, which are your developing countries. So I have to admit here in the Philippines, we really need to take more effort than usual to, lab uh, to uh, level up our sustainability programs, and biosecurity measures. Uh, of course, not only concerning our aquaculture products, but also other sectors or other fishery sectors. Now, along the course of a surveillance, the team will surely encounter a variety of issues that will eventually explain our, maybe our past failures. So there will be a lot of realizations at this step. If you are sensitive enough, to integrate the social, environmental, and economic aspects and impacts of disease surveillance. Now, uh, let's look at, the, at why this 12-step uh, checklist will not work. I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, it will not work if uh, we don't work. Of course, challenges uh, will always be there for us to surmount, especially in a developing country like the Philippines. But uh, you can review in the paper here uh, success stories mentioned like in Chile, in China, okay, in uh, Norway, and the United Kingdom. Now, their development and uh, implementation of strict disease surveillance systems help them prevent a variety of economic losses due to disease outbreaks. So they learn from their experience. Uh, but of course, how about here in the Philippines? So it's really high time to consider this checklist and um, maybe we can develop programs that will also help our aquaculture industry recover. So if we look at data from BFAR, our, for example, our exports are not as strong as our imports. Although uh, we cannot really uh, fully attribute this to the lack of uh, robust quality management or uh, a disease surveillance system, we can really feel that something is wrong with our, uh, with our, uh, with our system here. Surely this uh, checklist is only as easy as we look at it in paper. So in the real world, there are many factors to consider. The countries alone uh, already differ from each other in terms of resources, uh, experts, expertise, and uh, even culture. But as my uh, former professor said, uh, despite all the complications at hand, we must start somewhere else. So this checklist is the best way to start a system. And I believe this will eventually evolve and adapt to the country where this will be implemented. Now, publication of design, implementation, and results is uh, strongly encouraged. I believe this is a great opportunity for research and uh, the creation of alternative designs for monitoring 
who knows, uh, our limitations here in the Philippines can make us device a more uh, straightforward and uh, cost-efficient surveillance system. So if we do some serious collaboration, guys, or make a project proposal for this, maybe we can make it happen. Okay? So again, uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, you can read the entire paper yourselves for a more uh, clearer or clear viewpoint of the authors themselves. And again, this is Professor Brian Ives Araneta of Iloilo State College of Fisheries. Subscribe to my channel to encourage me to make more fisheries content in the future.